Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. So that's information, resources, services, activities, and so on for people who work in and around the global community, uh, working on medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and associated businesses. Um, and importantly, for people who want to learn more about our business um, and, and maybe start working as a medical writer and so on. Um, so you'll find lots of resources at medcomsnetworking.com. Uh, specifically, if you look at Network Pharma TV, you'll find hundreds of videos now relevant to our business. Um, and if you do have an interest in coming and joining us in Medcoms, go and have a look at first medcomsjob.com. Okay, so at the moment I'm doing, uh, I'm having a bit of fun talking to people who uh, work in and around Medcoms um, about their own personal journeys um, and learning a bit more about what they're up to. So uh, today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Catherine White. Um, she's actually the author of a guide that we've published, um, which is about working as a freelance medical writer. Um, so Catherine, over to you, just, just tell us a little bit about how you started in the business. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Peter. Um, I had a quite an unusual route into medical writing, I suppose, because I did a chemistry degree and PhD at university, whereas normally I think they generally prefer biological sciences. But I found my way um, through clinical research, which again was from the labs um, via secondment, really enjoyed clinical research. And then an opportunity again via secondment for medical writing arose. Um, and so I moved in there because that was the part of clinical research I really, really did enjoy um, was the writing of the protocols and study reports, etc. So once I reached the six months of comment, I, I was given the opportunity to, st to stay in the team um, and through medical writing, then that gave me the perfect opportunity eventually to go freelance Um which gave me a lot more flexibility in terms of working from home and um, actually getting to know community around me, to be honest. Um, and I haven't really looked back. I've really enjoyed the breadth and variety of work that that's given me. So, yeah, got there eventually. Absolutely. And just let's clarify a couple of things there. So you started off in, in Big Pharma, basically. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah. So I was employed okay. by Big Pharma for a number of years, actually. Yeah. Since 96. And that would have been in in uh, and when you got into the medical writing, let's um, let's just be clear on the terms not terminology here. Mm. Uh, regulatory writing was was what you were doing, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the case. I think that's what the attraction of going freelance was ultimately was when you're employed. I found certainly in big pharma, you're you're siloed a little bit. So I was very much regulatory writing, supporting submissions and supporting clinical trials. Um, whereas when I became more freelance, I was offered a more a, a greater variety of work, including the medcoms side of things, which I really enjoy, which I think is a little bit allows you a little bit more creativity in some respects than the regulatory. But I enjoy dipping my toe in both both areas. Okay. Yeah. And just just explore that one a little bit, because I like doing this with people who are from the regulatory writing side. Yeah, you know, just yeah. a little a little bit of what you do in regulatory writing versus what you do in medcoms writing. What's the compare and contrast? Yeah. So I think regulatory writing for me is a little bit more your um you're following regulations, you have templates, so things like I I mean I I I include writing clinical study reports and protocols and informed consents under regulatory right. writing. So it is very much I, I suppose there is a, a, a set pattern and a, a set sort of language for me with medcoms I would put maybe writing journal articles and the medcoms and posters and abstracts so for me obviously there's still guidelines and rules you have to follow but there are different skills in the sense that you have to be often very concise you have to put a lot of information in a very small space because you often have word count restrictions which maybe you don't always have in regulatory writing and you can just be a little bit more creative because I suppose in regulatory writing, you're still writing for humans. And I think we sometimes forget that regulators are still humans who are having to read that text. But there's a certain style of language and scientific language, whereas I think in medcoms, you have that, but you're you can often get involved with writing for patients or, you know, writing for journal articles. They rely on subscriptions often. So you you have to make it really readable. People want to be, able, you know, want to get the information, but in a re really readable, reader friendly format, I suppose. Right. OK, OK, OK. And, and in the, this is something I often have conversations with people about. They, they want I mean, let's let's take it back to basics. I want to be a medical writer. And um, you, you, my first question is, well, what do you mean by that? Because there are lots of, you know, uh, we can talk about regulatory and medcoms, but there are other forms of medical writing mm. as well. And it's just something I think people need to think a little bit about and start to tune into the different types of medical writing. But as you say, as a freelancer, you essentially, I mean, the, the beauty of freelancing is you can sort of choose to do what you want to do sort of thing. Yeah. And um, so, uh, 
and, and you have, you know, you, you've written that guide for us. Um, you've, mm. you, I've heard you speak. You're involved with people like the European Medical Rights Association in the past and so on, uh, running workshops and things for people who want to be medical rights uh, freelancers. Um, just talk, just spend a couple of minutes. Let's just have a bit of fun. Talk a little bit about the sorts of things you say to people who want to or are thinking about becoming a freelance medical writer. Um, oh, goodness me. Uh, I, I, I have to say I mm. haven't looked back. But I think for me, it is that breadth. Of, you have to be brave. I think it, it, it's not quite the, you know, the nirvana of flexibility and you can, you know, <laughs> I mean, I do enjoy a coffee shop, as my friends will tell you and colleagues will tell you, I do take my laptop to the, <laughs> to the coffee shop. But there is a there is an element of flexibility. I'd be lying to say there isn't. But managing clients, managing client expectations, all of a sudden you're not the employee anymore. You are a business owner and therefore you have to take that seriously. Otherwise, you can't expect your clients to. Yeah. And I think clients often forget. And I was as guilty as well when I was employed. You forget that if you contract somebody, they're not just working for you. They're working for other clients. So they're in their own little bubble of they want to get this document out yesterday and they completely don't they forget right. quite rightly it's not there you know that you also have other clients that are also having the same so managing your workload is a big big challenge I think for most freelancers that's what, that's what most of my freelance colleagues would say is managing the work because documents can disappear for longer than you planned and then they'll suddenly pop up just as you're hitting a deadline for another client so it is it is managing the the peaks and troughs of workload primarily and and managing client expectations um and I think putting in your first invoice, you know, knowing how much to charge, because it's very difficult to get that information, I think, out generally. People are a little bit reluctant to talk about rates and things. So, yeah, I think that's I can remember still remember submitting my first invoice and thinking they'll never agree to that. But they, you know, they <laughs> they do. And and, they do. and once you and, and I think as you go on and experience more clients, some good, some not so good work, you know, you get to know what you enjoy and you get to know the clients that you enjoy working for. And then as your confidence grows, you can be a little bit more selective about the projects and clients you take on. Okay. okay. And I know you're, you're talking about balancing your clients, but I know one of the, one of the topics you do talk about a lot is sort of life work balance mm. and so on. So uh, again, just talk a couple of minutes, just, just on that side of things. Have you got a couple of tips for people in terms of juggling, not just the work, the clients with each other, but also your own personal life? Sort of? Yeah, I think two things uh, come to mind immediately is I think have a designated, where you're able, have a designated workspace that you can close the door at the end of the day or, you know, segregate off that part of the house or wherever you're working um so that you can actually switch off I think and be very clear when your best time is to work if you can with your clients I, I tend to have a morning I found that I was I have animals to look after so I I found that I was kind of sitting down at my desk then getting up to walk the dog then sitting down at the desk then getting up to do something else and that didn't work for me in the end so so now I find that I I work better if I do all the animals and everything I have to do personally in the morning um you know exercise whatever and then I sit down at a mid-morning depending on workload lunchtime and and then I know I'm sat at my desk for however long and that for me helps me focus so it's it's understanding that when you work best and and you really do need to keep take that time off I say that when I do my talks is you owe it to your clients because you you want to be your best self for your clients you owe it to your clients and also the best ideas you know you might come up with the best solution for a client's problem when you're walking the dog or taking the children to school or something it it's yeah. when your mind's not buzzing around that particular problem that often a solution comes. So you, you do owe it to you. That's how I flip it around to make myself feel better about <laughs> taking time off, I suppose, if I'm honest. <laughs> you know, you owe it to your clients to be your best self. <laughs> okay. okay, that's very reasonable. And, and and we're talking, you know, at the time we're talking, what is it, uh, the August 2022. You know, we've had a, a strange couple of years, mm. pandemic and all the rest of it. Um, again, you, you, you've been freelancing, I think I'm right in saying about 12 years or so. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, quite a lengthy time. And you've you've seen a lot of changing in working practice and so on. But the last couple of years, there's been quite a dramatic change in working practice in many companies and, and clients and so on. Again, any reflections on how how different or how how things been for you as a freelancer for the last couple of years maybe is what I'm asking. yeah I oh, there's definitely it feels to me like there's definitely still work around I have certainly haven't seen a dip in work offers or load um it feels intense I think talking I'm just about to get a network together of my network of freelancers we're going to have a lunch together um in a few weeks time and it's interesting people are taking more time off 
I think this summer, suddenly the doors have opened globally and people are off. I think it's been quite, it's felt quite intense, even if I've not necessarily been working stupid hours, it's felt intense. Everything's right. just felt intense. And I think people are just <laughs> having to take a bit of a breather. So work has been coming in. I think it's actually worked in our favour. Well, from my experience, I'm talking for a few colleagues, we're all busy. Right, um, right, right. Do you think, um, just to point Pete down on that one, have the... Uh, because you've you've always, as far as I know, anyway, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but as a freelancer, you've worked remotely, haven't you, for the yes. number of yeah, years? Yes, yeah, um, In the last couple of years, the clients have changed their working practices and a lot of them are working remotely and flexibly and so on. Um, have you seen that work to your advantage in a, in a way? Because they, they sort of, everyone's working remotely, so it's not so odd that you're working remotely sort of thing. Have you seen seen that sort of thing happening? Um, do you know, it hasn't really, I think hasn't if I'd have been effect. employed, it would have been because, you know, employers are, were always a little bit, they would allow you to work from home, but it, you could tell it was, they weren't comfortable, a lot of them weren't comfortable with it. I think from a freelance perspective, I haven't really, I, I think I've been very grateful that I have an office set up because I've seen friends trying to work, you know, juggle right. everything from the kitchen table. Um But other than that, the only thing that's changed for me, interestingly, and I think it's a good thing, is that we have, with clients, it used to be a phone call or emails primarily and now we're more likely to have a zoom call so i've yeah, got really to know cool. my clients a lot better i think right oh, that's interesting yeah okay okay which is a, definitely a positive isn't it mm. okay okay all right look we haven't got very long for these little chats but i think it's great to just get a bit of an insight into what you're doing and, and, and how you're doing it so um i know i can speak for you and say that anybody can can reach out to mm. you by linkedin is the easy way um but i know that you're always very happy to help people who are thinking yeah, about yeah. becoming a freelancer or they're already a freelancer in and yeah. around medical writing. So if anyone's watching this, do do reach out to Catherine. That'd be great. So look, thank you very much. And, and I'm going to wish you luck, but I'm going to stop.